as a society, if you build roads, people drive on them. It did not solve traffic. No, it actually made it worse. Because it, it made it easier for people to move, let's say, out of the, outside of the city. They try to commute in for jobs. Things like that. And I know, I know if you're on a seven-lane highway in Los Angeles and you get to wait in traffic for one hour and move 10 feet, it's an enjoyable thing. <laughs> Has anyone ever done that before? Yes. So it's, it's, I know Helen does a lot like that. But also two more things. They did, they did expand Social Security to farmers and self-employed and they, there is no national health care insurance like both Truman and Roosevelt wanted, but they did subsidize health insurance. Employers <laughs> can deduct the cost of health insurance that they give to their employees. And that is that was a way they pay less taxes and therefore it subsidizes health care. And that is why, it's, why about half, a little bit over half of all people who work in the United States, their health care is provided by their employer. My health care is provided by my, my employer. That's part of my pay. And then they pay less taxes. I do, what that means is that the government subsidizes that. But that's why we have this incredibly complex Rube goldberg system of health care. Where we have some people with private insurance, some people no insurance at all. There's uh, health insurance for the elderly, health insurance for veterans. It's just an incredibly complex system. Yes? Um. Do you think they expand Social Security to other Farmers and self-employed. Oh, self-employed. But instead of, like today, like for me, I pay 6.2% tax, and then the school districts pay 6.2%. If you're self-employed, you pay the whole thing, 12.4%. And another big element is 1950s, so expanding consumer economy. And we talk about the Great Depression, there's more people with money, but there was a real economic great issue. Compression. Great compression. compression. Remember the Great Compression where the gap between the rich and the poor shrunk? Well, it depends on your point of view. If you're Keynesian, you believe that's good. If you are through the trickle down, that's bad. But more people have more money than ever before. But there was actually an economic issue. Companies were producing goods faster than ever before. Once they retooled after the war going in the 50s, they could pump out cars or look at this brand new wondrous 15-inch television. They tried to make these consoles and like to be a big part of your furniture. So when I was a kid, everyone had these big, big wood things, veneer, wood-sided, big, bassy TVs. I'm glad that thing went away. <laughs> they remember, remember most of helping people move and they weighed about three tons. <laughs> And, but what is it called where you produce so much, you become more efficient, your cost drops? What is that called? That's economies of scale. These companies could just churn out the cards. The problem was they need to sell to make money. How do you keep demand up? How do you convince people to buy cars two or three years after they just bought a car? It's the new Actually, they were coming to the two things. First off, and, both, and I heard it both. Heard both of them. First one is advertising went to its golden age. Selling, convincing people to buy things they don't need. Convincing people that they deserve the new thing. That's where Chevrolet, that's where Cadillacs were. Oh, you're finally made. I get that Cadillac. And now there are more car companies like that. But, you know, Lexus like that too. You know, the idea is, you know, boy, you really made it. Don't you want to show you made it? You're a loser if you don't have one. You deserve a break today. Okay, that's my problem. But anyways, to convince people to buy things that they, they could not have survived without, and then planned obsolescence. I heard that too. The idea is either to make it so it's going to break right away, or you're going to come up with a new model. That's where you get this ad for the 56 Chrysler. And it's not as big a deal as it used to be, but... When I was your age, there was a big deal with a new model view where they would make some kind of cosmetic change to the car. And this will do it, but make some cosmetic change and then sell it as a whole brand new car. And you were a total loser if you didn't have the new, well, I, these are actually, those are the savers. By the way, you notice that? That's why they put a F-86 fighter plane here called the saver. 
The tail fin, see the big tail fins? To make it look like a jet plane. That's where the tail fins came. They go. And they would the tail plane, the tails got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. If they want to sell so many cars, how can they make a lot of money? Like in today, like they're cars, like they don't want to spend so much prices well, part, part of that's inflation. So there's always going to be a small price increase because you, it, there is a tiny bit of inflation. But not, you know, they still have this, they still sell lower cost, cost cars, but they really want to push you. You want to get the more expensive ones with the proof of the engineers. So those are the ones you might notice more. And you'll see with all types of products, well, for either, well, the, all kinds of products, for either they make something where it breaks really easy. And think about when it becomes more technologically advanced. And therefore, if something breaks, it's harder to fix, isn't it? So what do you do? Get a new car. Yeah, get a new car, get a new TV. You think about TV today. You're going to fix those? No, they're designed to throw away. Toss them. And anybody here with a cell phone, you have one, it's like a giant plant obsolescence dream for manufacturers. It's just a the dream product. Because you buy it, the day you buy it, it's already obsolete. And you will soon have to get a new one. So technology is classic for planned obsolescence. Yeah. And so, and then think about all the disposable things in our society. How many things you use once or twice and throw it away? Yeah. Yeah. Pen, well, who's got the water bottle? Yeah, Thanks I a lot. I refilled this. Whatever you want me to put it. The styrofoam cup. Thanks a lot. <laughs> we all do it. But think about how many things. I mean, well, you have to have a society with a lot of affluence, a lot of surplus to have such a throwaway world. To have society based upon that. But then again, I understand. We live in a society where that's now the way we function. So it's hard to find anything else. I thought this was a fun picture. I remember the district spent thousands of dollars to get everybody to get a. Uh, um, t to get brand new TVs for every classroom. This is early 2000s. See them anywhere? There's still a few rooms, but the TVs just kind of stuck up there. In fact, they pay for mounts, and then they're all gone. Yeah. That's, it was a big deal. Everyone got it mounted, and pretty soon no one ever wanted it. And Roger Rees was probably the most famous of the advertisers, and I'll show you just a little bit of his hands. That's the what's happening when that headache strikes. Look, pain mounts up. It's you feel dull, right depressed. Yeah. Tension puts nerves on edge. What do most doctors recommend? The ingredients in anison. Yes, medical surveys show three out of four doctors recommend the Purely ingredients in anison. Anison for incredibly fast anison. rid of the headache, anison. neuritis, neuralgia. Here's why. Doctors know aspirin has only one pain reliever. At buffering, you still get only one. But anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, a combination of ingredients to one, relieve pain, two, fight depression, three, calm jittery nerves. You get fast relief of pain, fight depression, calm jittery nerves. What wonderful relief. And that? Okay, so. Are there different medic? No, it's just purely made up stuff. Roger Reed was the guy who did the Eisenhower Answers America I showed on Friday. And another big demographic shift was the baby boom. And it was the increase, but the big thing is sustained high birth rate from after World War II to the middle of the 60s. And they always give this people, the people born there, the baby boom generation. And then they, after this, they want to give every generation a name, which is kind of silly. But Think about the war and depression. People would be very reluctant to start families. Or for that matter, to get married. They would wait to make sure they know about the future. But with the war being over and increased affluence, what you got to get is they felt better about the future to have babies and get married younger. The marrying age dropped dramatically in the 50s. More and more people, in, their, in fact, women went down to almost, nine, or, um, almost 18. Get married. I think it was 18.7 was the average age for women to get married in the first five years of the 50s. And you know, pre-industrial times, times of bad economic times, have been uncertainty. People wait because they don't know. But here, got married very young, and this had a high sustained birth rate. 
and this will ripple to all parts of society. You know, they're going to need schools, they're going to need homes, they're going to need jobs after um, college or jobs after this, and then, well, man, I'm retiring right now. Who has, if you go from 45 to 65 approximately, who has a parent in this? Yeah. A few in this class. <laughs> and this is also a good one. I love all the babies. And one thing about this, in the 50s, they figured out the best way to make sure that babies are healthier is to immediately separate them from the mother and keep them isolated. <coughs> Which is so completely oh, opposed. Nice. Everyone knows how bad that is. You got immediately put them together for so many reasons. But yeah, they would isolate them. So immediately take the baby away. It's just. <laughs> yeah, but. Pop up with depressants and no one would notice. It was a weird time. But. This would be a big then demographic shift, and you really can see it by the 70s how the birth rate. And so this new age, all these new people with perhaps more money, but there's something else. Oh, but the big thing is mothers are living longer before World War II. One out of four pregnancies ended in the death of a mother. And so many, so many people did not live beyond the age of one. Life expectancy was so low by the 1950s. So another reason for the baby boom was that we're surviving. We can live. Childbirth is not even a death sentence. And they called it the troika. <laughs> that was uh, life expectancy. Public health improved dramatically. And these basic things that here in the United States, we mostly take for granted unless you live in certain big cities. Clean water. Vaccination. I mentioned Salk and the polio vaccine when I talked about the FDR. And of course, pasteurization. That was such a big, a big issue in the in children living beyond the age of one, let alone longer lifespan. And it wasn't part of the Troika, but I thought we should, should add that in there. Antibiotics. You know, healthcare became so much more effective. And People began to live longer. We have all kinds of problems with antibiotics now. I'll mention the big one in just a second, but this is kind of <laughs> poor girl. I can still remember getting my polio shot, and I swear to you, that needle was like that big. I was three, and I remember kind of looking up and like this thing just coming at me, <laughs> the nurse laughing. <laughs> I had that part. No, I got one. I got one of those boosters, like six, a little six syringe. That's what I have. And so I have a little mark right here. So there. All right, I've got my vaccination. Hmm? It must have been four. 1922. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All those crazy said something else. Antibiotics? Yeah, it's right down here. Oh, yeah. And one thing about this in the 50s, or especially the 60s, when they changed the way they did feedlots for cattle, and they knew that cattle really fattened up if they ate corn. So they fatten up really fast. The problem is corn is toxic for cows. But you pump them through a bag full of antibiotics, they can live longer to the slaughter. And that's leading to all sorts of problems. I think some of you probably know what I'm talking about. With being resistant to antibiotics. That's probably the biggest reason in the United States. It's all the antibiotics they give to cows. And then once they worked with cows, they started giving it to pigs and chickens and gophers. And so, one more element of the 1950s the cult of domesticity, not that it ever went away, but it would be pushed more than ever before. And the role of women, and when did the, when did the cult of domesticity start? With what big event? Industrial yeah, that industrial revolution, the change of the 19th century. The call, with women, their role in society changed. Remember how economically important they were before the industrial revolution. But now the role of women, according to this, be number one, they have to do what? Have kids. Take care of home. Get married. Oh. Then have kids. Then take care of the home. Be waiting for the husband when they got home. And that's wrong with that kid. And. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the thing is, the cult of domesticity, that was a creation of the Industrial Revolution. The traditional role of women was from the 1840s. It's not the traditional role of the beginning of time. And this was really pushed on for lots of reasons, but partially during the war, millions of women took jobs that men had. What was the nickname given to so many of the women who got these jobs? Yeah, Rosie. Rosie the Riveter. Actually, very few women riveted, not because they couldn't do it, but it took a lot of specialized training and they had to get things going fast. So, welded. Welders. It is Rosie the River, not one of the world. Have you thought about that? After the war, what's going to happen? So, my grandma built bombers in World War II at the North American factory outside of Omaha, Nebraska. What's that? Instead of Rosie the River, I have to go back to Rosie or really good wife. For <laughs> yeah, Rosie the really good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 Rosie, the really good one. That doesn't work. Well, though. That doesn't roll off the thumb. The thumb. <laughs> well, she made bombers, B 25s, B 24s, and B 29s. In fact, she became an inspector and a supervisor. She was really proud of what she did. I love, I love talking to my grandma about that. I mean, she's so, she's such a big deal that she felt part of it, especially when she was inspecting spare parts that would go. All the way to Guam or Tini and for the bombers that were damaged. She really felt like she was part of it. And she, as a supervisor, had men and women under her. And in fact, she was on the wing of a plane in the spring of 1945, a B-29 bomber. She was inspecting the engine mounts. And they had these VIPs coming. They were Army officers, Army Air Force, and they were told, don't talk to them, this is top secret. In fact, they came in, they didn't have their rank or insignia, nothing on them, just their khaki uniforms. This was top secret. And the guy who's clearly in charge stood under the plane, a little group. My grandma was on the wings. So stood on the plane. I looked at the plane and said, "Okay, this plane will be my plane." And it was Paul Tibbets, Colonel Paul Tibbets, and that plane would be known as the Enola Day. And so, a very small world that my grandma and just inspected the wing. And the way I look at it, my grandma made all of those planes. But. <laughs> August 14th, it was BJ Day, you know, heard about the war ending, and she said, you know, we stayed up all night, you know, celebrating the war over. All the workers came back, men and women, and they had all the women get on one side, and every single woman got a thing to So she was a supervisor, and the men who were under her, they stayed. So part of it was to get women to go back, but one of the weird little quirks in fact, my grandma said it, you know, the way she put it, I had this horrible feeling in my gut because I did it and I know I could do it and stay working there. But at the same time, I wanted to go home because that was normal and I wanted to get back into normal. And so a lot of women accepted it, wanted it because it felt normal, even though there was always that lingering, she called it pain, that I could do it. But I wanted to go back to what was normal. And remember, girls were taught from day one. You know, one way to be a successful person in your life. Get married. Have kids. So she went back, she had a daughter, and soon a son, another son, you know, that kind of thing. And so that is the thing you have to get. So they accepted. Women went back, but there's always this kind of lingering memory. But the important thing to know is that I'll say it again. So get this down. In the cult of domesticity, unlike men, women have only one avenue for success. That's to get married. If they do anything else, they're a failure. There's something wrong with them. If they want to go off to college or get a career or get a profession or get a job, there's something wrong. If they want to wait to get married, there's something wrong with them. If they don't want to have children right away, there's something wrong with them. Where men have all these different avenues for success. Doesn't mean they'll achieve it, but a lot of different opportunities. Women, there was only one. And they, they did anything else, they're always looked at as odd. Yes? Well, that would be weird, too. <laughs> that's women's job. And so that's really going to be one of the emphasis of the modern women's rights movement. Is that memory that, wait a second, we did this. 
and yet now we're not allowed, and that's a failure, especially when over a third of all women still have to work. And that would seem wrong with that. So it was a mistake you wanted to rectify. And so this would be a big deal. And to give you an idea of the casual sexism, I put a couple ads from the 1950s. It was routine, the idea of this pushing this cult of domesticity where women are this gentler, fairer, and certainly not as capable. Obviously, even women could open that. Normally, women could never open a jar of ketchup. This one is inexplicable. What does it say? If your husband ever finds out that you're not store testing for fresher coffee, he will beat you. I know it's supposed to be. He's staying her. That is inexplicable. And you know what? That's supposed to be. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. It's just hilarious. And then sooner or later, your wife will drive home one of the best. Your wife will drive home one of the best reasons for owning the Volkswagen. See? She'll drive home. <laughs> you know how women are. It says right here women are soft and gentle, but they get things. <laughs> Casual sexism was everywhere. It still exists in commercials, though. I mean, think how many commercials are about cleaning products or child rearing. There isn't for kids, and 90% of the time it's still women doing it. So, what we're coming out of this, though, is a shifting American dream that's going to come out with this new creation of the middle classes. It's going to be known in the United States. Remember that Great Compression. The gap between the rich and the poor, and if people now can afford to be happy because they can eat lard. With that, <laughs> the best part is look how shiny their hair is. Okay, with that, because lard is. But because of the Great Depression, before, remember it was still that to become an independent farmer, but with the Great Depression, yeah, that's not. By the way, what, what's that little independent farmer? What do you call him? Yo, man. Well, now it's, I put down home, but I'm thinking own your own house, car. And then as the 50s go on, all these great new gizmos you could buy, most importantly, television. And television would come to dominate everything. In fact, even home building. You ever seen a picture window in a house? That's where you have your own TV screen in your house. A big window in the front. Like a TV. And that became the new dream. And to a lesser degree, even though they would like to do uh, have a better life for their children, society, the economic the economy seems so dynamic that if you just gave them the opportunities you have, your children will do better than you. And that's the way it was for every generation of this in the 20th century. Every generation, their children at least economically, did better than their parents did. What was that for us? Weren't like Flamingo products super, uh, super popular in the 50s? Oh, like Flamingos? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, that became a big. It was kind of that idea of exotic. exotic. And Florida was just becoming popular. Yeah, you're the first generation, it would be the other one. Yeah. You won't mind. We'll do, we'll do economically, uh, you're not going to do the worst. College expenditures are a lot higher. There's a lot more monopoly, so there's not as many jobs there used to be. Yeah, it's these are conscious decisions made by people. So conscious decisions can be changed. But it's it. That's why I do get annoyed when you get people saying this generation they have these. Because you don't. Okay, I had a lot harder than you, but everyone else, you. <laughs> Yes. Part of the college thing, my mom talks to Betsy Austin about the state when she that, and their interest loans, their interest alone for their loans for college is fifteen hundred dollars. That's their interest alone on top of their like fifty for how long? every month. Their monthly interest is I can believe it. Of like a fifty dollar loan. I yeah, I, I had a friend did one of those very famous online ones, and he paid a hundred thousand dollars for a, a degree he can't use. So. There's some issues right now, and there's something severely wrong with her. <laughs> but there's a massive housing shortage. Here. Where are people living? There's no homes being built because of the depression and war. And now people are still living with their family. You know, they, they got married, they have kids, and they're living with their parents in a tiny little apartment. 
And it's not that you know the parents of the children don't love each other and all that. At least I like to hope so. But it's time to move on. They want to be alone. The parents want them to be successful, not necessarily have them all the time. People want their own freedom. It's no coincidence. I already put the house in shorties on the whiteboard twice, but I wanted to. That is where we get to the growth of suburbia. So think about in the city, it's going to be really expensive with limited space, but you plow up a cock or plow up a cornfield and you have a new town. And the thing about it was to take advantage of this, these new developments came around most famously in, uh, in, on Long Island and also outside of Philadelphia, Levittown. Levittown, the first ones in Long Island. And then the bell rang. And the bad part about that is. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We got to listen to No, don't do it, please. Do it. No, we want the camera. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like ice, I like ice. Everybody likes ice. I for president, I like the banner. Time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. One more time! I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like ice, I like ice, everybody like ice for president, I like the banner, you should go. Good Americans to come to the aid of their country. One more time. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like I, I like I, everybody like I for president. I got the banner, beat the gun. We'll take I to Washington. We don't want to or hurry. Let's do that big dog fighting. Let's get in step with the guy that's up. Get in step with I. You like I. For all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. One more time. You see, it's not truly fun. I'm for president. I'm for president. I'm for president. I'm for president. You like I. I like I. Everybody like I. I'm for president. I got the banner. Beat the drum. We'll say thank you for the drum. We don't want to die. Or hurry. Let's do that big drum fight. Let's get in step with the guy that's left. Get in step with the other way. We all go with five. Good Americans who come to the aid of their country.
I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like I, I like I, everybody like I, I for president, I love the banner, we make time to Washington, we don't want John or Harry, let's do that, take the party, let's get in step with the guy that's up, get in step with I, you like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president, I love the banner, we make time to Washington, now is the time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. All right, so we got work to do. Skippers.